I'm going to start chapter one of this book that I was reading in my previous video. I dug this book out. This is one of the very first books I read on the Illuminati. This was a book that came out originally, anyways, long before Behold the Pale Horse, New World Order by Ralph Epperson, or many of the other conspiracy books that came out in the 90s. This said came out in the 80s. So, Illuminati 666 compiled by William Hosea Sutton. Or, or uh, Josiah or Hosiah. It's spelled, his middle name spelled J O S I A H. Chapter 1. In the last book of the Bible, Jesus Christ gives his last warning before he returns the second time. This last day warning is found in chapters 13, 14, 16, 17, and 18 of the book of Revelation. Jesus warns his people about how the whole world will be deceived into worshiping Satan, symbolized as the seven-headed dragon attacking a woman, a symbol of the true faith. In Revelation chapter 13, verses 4, 8, and 9, sorry, getting situated here, Jesus' prediction about the worship of Satan throughout this world may be read, quote, And they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear, unquote. The Apostle John wrote, quote, Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time, unquote. 1 John 2.18 The Apostle Paul warned, quote, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalted himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, 3 and 4 There are various ways our Lord has made known to his followers how to detect Satan, who is the invisible head, of a partly religious and partly political movement. Revelation chapter 13 verse 18 warns it would be branded with the number 666. In Revelation chapter 17 verse 5, our Lord describes this satanic movement that is Antichrist in a symbol of a lewd, beautiful woman. And upon her forehead was a name written, quote, Mystery Babylon the Great, Mother of Harlots and Abominations of the Earth, unquote. And let me stop here for a second. I'm not, just because I'm reading this, doesn't mean that I agree word for word everything of what this author believes about the Bible and prophecy. I am reading this book to share some of the, uh, there's a lot of great information in this book. And also, once in a while, I don't mind sharing stuff that, you know, being open-minded about somebody else's understanding of the Bible and prophecy. I already did previous videos about what I felt about the last days in the Bible. If you want, go check those out. But that doesn't mean that I close that it completely closed my mind to other stuff. So, just to make that clear, I'm not trying to confuse anybody. The very last warning our Lord has now given the deceived world is found in Revelation chapter 18:4. Quote, and I heard another voice from heaven saying. Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, that ye receive not of her plagues, unquote. There are three distinct messages symbolized as three angels of Revelation 14. Revelation chapter 14, 6 and 7 is calling the world away from the worship of the dragon, to worship God who created the heaven, earth, and the sea, and the fountains of waters. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 8, it tells how Babylon the Great is fallen, and how she has made all nations to drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. However, in Revelation chapter 14, 
9 and 10 reread the most solemn warning ever given to the world, of which most are completely ignorant. Satan is hardly ever mentioned in many Christian circles, much less how he is predicted in Scripture to lead most to lose their salvation. Quote, and the third angel followed him, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Unquote. Revelation chapter 14, 9 and 10. God reveals that all nations have already been deceived by Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And our Lord is calling his people out of Babylon. But the question to most is, what is Babylon? This is the whole purpose of this book. It is to lay wide open for all to see what the sins of Babylon the Great are, and who she is, and who this mysterious scarlet-colored beast is that she is riding on, as described in Revelation chapter 17, 1 through 8. While we study the history and the nature of Babylon the Great and of the beast that is carrying her, we will learn that there was, is, and always shall be in this world avowed worshippers of Lucifer. Some will be shocked to learn that Luciferians have lived and died in promoting the worship of Lucifer through Babylonian, Egyptian, and Druid witchcraft, and are determined to overthrow all religions and governments. Their goal is to unite the world into a one-world government and exalt Lucifer as the only god of this world. You know, whether I totally agree or not, you know, we clearly are seeing the uh, um, Lucifer, Satan, becoming more and more of a popular religion. Satanism, witchcraft. So, you know, this book is written in the all the way back in the 80s, most of it. So... You know, you read this and you're kind of seeing what's going on today and you're like, wow. But anyways, as we continue to study the nature of Babylon the Great, we will study the philosophies of Wicca. Wicca is the modern version of Babylonian, Egyptian, and Druid witchcraft with millions of both male and female members. We will learn how apostles of Lucifer in the past and present are using secret societies, communism, international banking, Christian fronts, hang on, Ah, I itch there. And social issues, like Black Lives Matter, to further their plans. We will learn how these modern day witches are ever determined to overthrow the worship of Jesus Christ and Christianity by using subliminal warfare, mind sciences, and physical force. This Luciferian plot to destroy all religions and all governments, so that a one world Luciferian government may be established, is coming today in what is known as the Aquarian Age, or the New Age Movement. In Latin, it is called Novus Ordo Seclorum, New Order for the Ages. But its real, concealed name is the Illuminati. And it will be shown that it was from the secret order of the Illuminati that communism was derived. We will study the origin of the number 666 and who today is branded with it. We will study the mark of the beast, with whom no true follower of Jesus will identify. We will take a journey through documentative, documentative history. Sorry, documentative history, starting with Lucifer's rebellion in heaven, and continue to expose through history how Lucifer was worshipped, both ignorantly and openly, through the astrological systems of sun worship. After the camouflages have been removed from paganism, that reveal it was in reality Satan who was worshipped as the sun god. Then we shall remove all the camouflages Lucifer is hiding behind today through false systems of Christianity and through an international political movement for a one-world government. These two symbols, Babylon the Great and the Beast, that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit, will be carefully studied and understood later on in the book. However, before the ordinary reader can comprehend any of these things, we must go back into history to the time of Adam and Eve and to the time of Noah and Nimrod, the origin of lies traces to Lucifer, found in Genesis chapter 3, verse 4. And the origin of false religion also began with Lucifer.
In Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 15, we read, quote, how, art thou, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above these stars of God. I will also sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Unquote. It has been Lucifer's plan from ancient times to gradually unite the entire world into a one world government that would reject its creator and worship Lucifer instead. Lucifer, before his fall, was the most exalted angel next to Christ. The son of the morning stood in the presence of God with Christ. He was the cover and cherub, the light bearer for God. However, Lucifer began to think of himself as equal in splendor and wisdom to God. He began to think he also deserved worship from the Lord's servants and began to plot against the Lord of heaven. Lucifer, the covering cherub, did set his face to overthrow, overthrow the worship of God. Lucifer did not at once reveal his covetousness. Lucifer did not at once reveal his covetousness. If he had exposed all of his plans to the universe, where sin and rebellion at that time were not known, he would not have gained much following. Lucifer's plot to overthrow the government of heaven would take long and careful planning. Little by little, Lucifer began to find others whose sympathy he would gain by criticizing how the Lord managed the affairs of the universe. Lucifer tried to make the God of love, the Lord of the Sabbath, appear to be a selfish tyrant. Lucifer, assuming the guise of godliness, led many heavenly beings to come over to his side by misrepresenting God's character, as if God himself were the evil one. Lucifer sowed seeds of murmuring, complaining, and strife, which germinated into rebellion, and caused divisions among the angels of among the angels of heaven. Lucifer tried to weaken the unity of heaven, thinking this would weaken the power of the Almighty. However, only one third of the heavenly host chose the side of the God of confusion. The whole universe chose only two sides. There was no middle ground. There was war in heaven between Christ and Lucifer. Quote, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Unquote. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. The very plans... The very plans Lucifer tried to execute in heaven, he is now conditioning the people of the world to accept. Just as Satan or Lucifer concealed his real plans from the angels in heaven in the beginning to overthrow the worship of God, so is Lucifer trying today to overthrow the true worship of God among the inhabitants of this world. Just as Satan did not suddenly expose his real plans that would have demanded the worship of him by heavenly beings, so has Satan camouflaged the worship of himself among earthly beings through a worldwide network of gods and goddesses, and later through false systems of Christianity. Sun worship was the greatest rival religion of the worship of Jehovah in the Old Testament. It was through sun worship that the worship of Lucifer was camouflaged throughout this world. Those who obeyed the pagan precepts were actually bowing their knee before the devil, not gods as they thought. Quote, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness, unquote. Revelation, or sorry, Romans chapter 6, verse 16. As the angels of heaven chose, side, chose sides before Lucifer was cast out of heaven, so will the people of this world join into two distinct groups before the end of this age. The line of distinction, which will be studied in detail in the closing chapter, will be drawn by the mark of the beast foretold in Revelation chapter 13, verses 11 through 18, and chapter 14, verses 6 through 13. The Luciferian plot to overthrow the worship of Jesus has always worked in secret, using camouflages to remain hidden. It has not come upon the world suddenly, but little by little. Likewise, we must also trace this history at of the great Luciferian conspiracy little by little. We will expose how primitive man was deceived into worshiping Lucifer, then bring the reader down through the centuries and show how Lucifer is being worshipped in these modern 1980s.
See, it just shows about three decades ago. Well, more than that now, 2020, yeah. Going on 40 years now. If this book is 83, yeah. A few years, this would be 40 years old. To begin this study, let's take a closer look at the name Lucifer itself. The name Lucifer in Latin means light-bearing. It may also mean the planet Venus, which is the morning star at dawn. And that's taken according to this source. He's got a two. He's got a footnote here, number two. That's taken from the World Book Encyclopedia, volume 12, 1979, page 847. Go on and check that out. In Greek mythology, Lucifer was personified as a male figure bearing a torch. Hence, we have the origin of the light bearer of the Olympic Games. The Greek transliteration of the name of this incarnation of Lucifer in the myth was Titan, spelled T-E-I-T-A-N. In Middle English, his name was Titan, which also meant sun god. A distorted record of the rebellion of Lucifer and that of the rebel giant Nimrod has been preserved in Greek mythology. Titan, or uh, the alternative spelling, I guess, Titan, that's the T-E-I-T-A-N, the personification of Lucifer was the ancestor of a race of giant humans here on Earth who were overthrown by the Olympian gods. Hence the word Titan today means one gigantic in size or power. And the word Titanism today in our language means, quote, spirit of rebellion or a defiance of and revolt against the established order or authority, unquote. As Lucifer was the chief leader that led the angelic host to rebel against God, so did Nimrod cause the early descendants of Noah to rebel against God. Flavius Josephus, the ancient Jewish historian, wrote about Nimrod and how he seduced the people of his day to rebel against God and was first to teach the arts of masonry while building the Tower of Babel. From the book, The Complete Works of Flavius Josephus, we read the following, quote, Now it was Nimrod who excited them to such an affront and contempt of God. He was the grandson of Ham, the son of Noah, a bold, a bold man and of great strength of hand. He persuaded them not to ascribe it to God as if it was through his means they were happy, but to believe that it was their own courage which produced that happiness. He also gradually changed the government into tyranny, seeing no other way of turning men from fear of God, but to bring them into a constant dependence on his own power. He also said he would be revenged on God if he would have a mind to drown the world again, for that he would build a tower too high for the waters to be able to reach, and that he would avenge himself on God for destroying their forefathers. Now the multitudes were very ready to follow the, the determination of Nimrod, and to esteem it a place of cowardice to submit to God. And they built a tower, neither sparing any pains, nor being in any degree negligent about the work. And by reason of the multitude of hands employed in it, it grew very high, sooner than anyone could expect. But the thickness of it was so great, and it was so strong, strongly built, that thereby its great height seemed upon the view to be less than it really was." Unquote. The Complete Works of Flavius Josephus, Whiston and Kriegel Publications, 1960-1978, page 30. Let's see how much time I have left here. There's a lot of good stuff in here, so... Okay. Nimrod tried to unite the whole known world of his day into a one-world government that would be anti-God or anti-Christ. God wanted the sons of Noah to eventually replenish the earth by traveling abroad the earth and settling in colonies. This would have kept in check the wickedness that has always derived out of the cities. In the beginning, it was not intended that man be crowded together in large cities. This Tower of Babel, the building of which Nimrod supervised, was to have two great significances. The city of Babel would become the metropolis of the world and unite its inhabitants under the dictatorial rule of Nimrod. And its tower was to be a monument to man to stand as a symbol of the wisdom of its builders. By building the city of Babel, 
Nimrod hoped to prevent the people from scattering abroad into colonies as the Lord attended. While in the midst of this building, when the tower reached a height that it could today be called skyscraper, our Lord came against it. In Genesis chapter 11, through verses 3 through 9, we read, quote, And they said one to another, Go, go to, let us make brick, and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have one language, and this they began to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad, from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it Babel, confusion, because the Lord there confounded the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Unquote. Nimrod, who built Nineveh, was worshipped by its early inhabitants under his deified name, Ninus, spelled N-I-N-I-S, N-I-N-I-S uh, sorry, N-I-N-U-S. He was first to incite people to war with their neighbors, after the confusion of tongues had scattered the early descendants of Noah over the earth. Trogus Pompeius, who wrote of Ninus, states that the first king in Nineveh caused the people to war against themselves. Alexander Hislop compiled this statement written by Trogus Pompeius, the ancient historian, in his book The Two Babylons, page 23, quote, Ninus, or Ninus, king of Assyrians, says, Trogus Pompeius, epitomized by Justin, first of all changed the contented moderation of the ancient manners incited by a new passion, the desire of conquest. He was the first who carried on war against his neighbors, and he conquered all nations from Assyria to Libya, as they were yet unacquainted with the arts of war, unquote. Hislop goes on to quote another ancient historian named Diodorus Siculus, and shows how Trogus Pompeius and Siculus both agree with each other. Quote, Ninus, the most ancient of the Assyrian kings mentioned in history, performed great performed great uh, actions. Okay, being naturally of a warlike disposition and ambition of glory that results from valor. He armed a considerable number of young men that were brave and vig vigorous like himself, trained them up a long time in laborious exercises and hardships, and by that means accustomed them to bear the fatigues of war and to face dangers with intrepidity. Unquote. Lo, Zook's brothers, Neptune, NJ, 1916, that first part is spelled L-O-I-Z-E-A-U-X, brothers, Neptune, NJ, 1916. I don't know what the heck that is. But anyways, um, just about out of time. i got to cut it down here after uh, about 23, 25 minutes. I don't want it to cut me off. So, okay. So far, pretty interesting information here. Take what you will out of it. It's not 100% perfect so far, but so far it's pretty good. Um, pretty decent. Take care.